thanks very much for inviting me. And just so you don't think I'm trying to skip out on fundraising, my donation's in that envelope. <laughs> Jonathan Brown doesn't freeload. Uh, I also will donate something else. I have, being you know, in the Bay Area, I want to contribute my intellectual capital. There's talk of a Muslim senior living facility, and that means there's going to be a lot of slippers. Automated slipper bringing. You know, someone can work on that, on the app. You two are supposed to laugh out loud at that joke. This is, okay, um, so I, I, was, I, I wanted to talk about the issue of what Muslims have contributed, and what Islam has contributed um, where Muslims and Islam have spread. And I want to talk about what Muslims and Islam can contribute here in the United States. The first thing that spread with Islam was justice. Justice spread with Islam. Justice and rights. And this is true not only in the founding scriptures of, scriptures of our religion, but it's true in historical practice as well. Islam offered basic protection of rights, basic due process, something that is important to keep in mind today. And it didn't matter if you were nasty or nice, if you were pious or impious. You had rights, you had the right to present your evidence, you had the right to defend yourself. You had the right to demand that person making accusation present proof if they were going to, if you were gonna be convicted. And just some examples from the life of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, in the Sunnah of Abu Dawood, there's a beautiful story about a man from Hadramaut and a man from the Kinda tribe. And they were in a dispute over land. And the Hadrami man accuses the Kindi man of taking his land. The Prophet says to him, to the Hadrami man, alayhi salam, he says, Alaka bayina? Do you have some direct evidence? Do you have witnesses that this man took your land? The Hadrami man said, no, I don't. But this kindi person, he's a bad person. He's a bad person. So the prophet turns to the man from the kindi tribe and he says, this man has no direct evidence. He has no bayina. And we all know that in Islam, if the person who's making the accusation has to have direct evidence, has to have bayina. If not, the person who's accused just has to swear an oath that they're innocent. And the kindi man swears an oath that he's innocent. The man from the Hadrami tribe says, this person is fajr la yubali ma halifa alayh. This person is a sinful person, he's openly sinful, he doesn't care what he swears about. Of course he's going to swear he's innocent. And the Prophet says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is all you're going to get from him. If he's telling a lie, then God will punish him on the day of judgment. But just because this person is a sinful person, just because he's a nasty person, doesn't mean that somehow you get to come and make an accusation against him and you get to get your way. No, he has a right to defend himself. And if no one can bring evidence to prove that he's committed a crime, then he swears an oath that he's innocent. It doesn't matter if he's a nasty person or not. So it doesn't matter if you're naughty or nice. In Islam, you have rights. It doesn't matter if you're Muslim or non-Muslim. It doesn't matter if you're Christian or Jewish. You have rights. And again, we see this in the life of the Prophet. In one famous case in Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, the companion Ashath bin Qais, is in a dispute with a Jewish person in Medina about land. And the Prophet asks Ashraf bin Qais again, Alaka bayina, do you have direct evidence? The man says no. Ashraf bin Qais says no. And the Prophet wait, rules in favor of the Jewish person. And Ashraf says, how can, you, how can you rule in the favor of this unbeliever against me, a Muslim? And the Prophet says, you didn't have bayana, you didn't have evidence. In Islam, it doesn't matter if you're Muslim or Christian. It matters what the evidence is. You have, the, you have rights. No one can take away, as great scholars like Abu Yusuf in his Kitab al-Kharaj, like many other Muslim scholars have said over and over again, no right, no property can be taken, no blood can be shed without direct, strong proof, without haq ma'loom, without a right that is known. This is 
sort of hard to imagine because today, especially as Muslims living in the United States, we live in a country that has already a robust system of rights and laws from which we benefit and which I want to talk about. But for, many, for much of human history, where Muslims went, there were not robust legal systems. There were not notions of protection of rights. So for example, when the Mongols converted to Islam, they had these courts called Yarghu courts. Don't even worry about how to spell that. It's a Mongol word, okay? They had Mo these Mongol courts. There was no notion of evidence. People just came in and said, this guy did this, this guy did that. The judge hears them, decides what he wants to do, kills someone right there, executes someone right there, takes someone's property right there. No notion of rights. When Mongols converted to Islam, they adopted Sharia law. When the famous traveler, Ibn Battuta, is traveling in, 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 uh, in now it's part of Sudan, right near the, on the Red Sea coast. He comes across a people who, they're not really Muslim. They're sort of a little bit, they know about Islam, but they're not really Muslim. And he notes they didn't give their daughters any inheritance. They didn't give their daughters any inheritance. In Islam, daughters always receive their rights. Always receive their rights. Even if it doesn't matter, as a parent, you, all you Muslim parents know this, you might not like your child, you might love one of your child and hate the other kid, but they both have their rights. They always will have their rights. Muslim scholars, as judges and as muftis, were always pushing rulers not to use excessive force, not to deny people due process. And I can give you so many examples of this. Muslims, who, scholars who lost their careers, who lost their lives, speaking out on the behalf of people who were accused unfairly, people who were the victim of some vendetta on the part of the ruler. I think actually Republicans should, should like Muslims because Muslims were always, have always been, opponents of unfair taxation. These are the original chai party, right? I just came up with that joke right now. There's, again, if you really, I, I really recommend this. Go get The Travels of Ibn Battuta. It's three volumes. It's published in Delhi. That's where I got the copy, at least. Well, I mean, I got it from another place. It was published in Delhi. It's very good. Translated by Hamilton Gibb. Excellent. We learned so much, so many great examples. Ibn Battuta was a judge. He was a scholar. So everywhere he go, he noticed things about Islamic law, which is fascinating. So when he goes to India, during the time of the Delhi Sultanate, Riyadh ad-Din ibn Tughlaq, in the, the mid-1300s, when he goes, he enters Multan. He comes from Central Asia, from Afghanistan. Uh, he said something very interesting about Afghans, by the way. He said, Kabul used to be a nice place. Now it's ruled by this tribe called Afghans, which is interesting. I swear, that's in the book. You can go check it out. He, goes to, he, he notices that when he first enters India, the Delhi Sultanate, the Delhi Sultan, Riyadhuddin ibn Tughlaq, is levying one quarter tax on everything that comes into his, all imports. One quarter tax. If it, much more than that, it'd almost be like Egypt, right? He, and, but what happens after the, the Abbasid Caliphate, the Abbasid Caliph sends a letter, people think the Abbasid Caliph ended in 1258, he didn't. The Abbasid Caliph was still in, in, uh, in Cairo after that. Uh, he sent a letter to Riyadh ibn, ibn Tughluq, recognizing him as the Muslim ruler there. And after that, the, the Delhi Sultan Riyadh ibn, ibn Tughluq felt very guilty about his taxation practices. He only then uh, levied the Sharia taxes of the Ushur and the Kharaj and the Zakat. This is something that's hard to imagine, hopefully, in the United States. But just the idea that it's the person who commits a crime who should suffer for that crime, this is also something that in many places is introduced by Sharia law. And I know this because when I taught at the University of Washington, we had these Afghan legal scholars who would come every year. And they were special, one of them was a specialist in Pashtun Wali, which is uh, Pashtun or Pashtun tribal law. It was, I had very interesting con conversations with this man. Very interesting. Because he said, and one of the rules in Pashtun tribal law is that, let's say I kill somebody's brother. He gets my sister as his wife. Now, that may resolve the conflict, but what did my sister do? I'm the one who committed the crime. 
In fact, I've been trying to find out from lawyers what you actually call a legal system that just says the person who commits the crime should answer for that crime. And they, no one can give me the answer because it seems so, it's so basic that people don't really have a word for uh, legal systems where someone else besides the person who's committed the crime is, actually bears the punishment for that crime. So this is, for, for many parts of the, 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 the world where Muslim, where Islam appeared, they didn't have notions even with it, the person who commits the crime is the one who should be punished. Muslim scholars that I mentioned before were constantly trying to limit. You have these, you know, warlords, basically. Pre-modern states are almost always ruled by military leaders, right? And these are the guys with all the muscle. And more often than they're not, they're not exactly the most educated. They're not always the most, uh, they don't always have the best temper, best anger management skills. And oftentimes, Muslim scholars are trying to advocate very gently, sometimes forcibly with these rulers to, to not apply punishments as harshly as they do. So, for example, in, in Aceh, one of the earliest parts of Southeast Asia to become Muslim, already Marco, Marco Polo visits there in the, in the 1290s, of the common era, and he sees that already people there, not only are they, uh, are they Muslim, but they're, they're actually using the Arabic alphabet. This one scholar, Nur ad-Din Raniri, in the 1600s, he managed to convince the Sultan of Aceh to stop boiling criminals in oil. So he, it's, he's actually very proud. He's very proud that he's accomplished this because he's, he's managed to get the, the ruler to stop this, this, this punishment that has no place in God's law. Another thing, and this is going to be very surprising to a lot of people, um, not here, but a lot of people in the, you know, maybe American media, where Islam spread, religious liberty spread. The Quran, when it says, so religion can be for God alone, this is a serious commitment that Muslims had. Religion it belongs to God. And actually, Muslims had a notion of religious liberty that in some ways is much more robust even than the United States. People don't, uh, you know, people tend to think of Muslims as being intolerant or Islam as being intolerant. But actually, Muslims in Islamic civilization, Muslim scholars and Muslim rulers exercise a level of t religious toleration that would really not, Americans wouldn't accept it. It's too tolerant. It is too tolerant. I'll give you some examples. First of all, people often wonder, how did Islam spread so quickly in the Middle East? Right, so the, the Prophet Laysa Hassan died in 632 of the Common Era. By 650, Muslims had reached all the way into Central Asia. In 711, they entered into Iberia and into what's now Sindh in Pakistan. Okay? How did, in 636, 637, they've taken over the entire Middle East, including Egypt. How did they do this? Actually, most of it was because the people who lived there, the Christians and Jewish population, were really happy to have someone besides the Byzantines and the Persians ruling them. Especially people like the Muslims who absolutely didn't care what religion you practiced. In the year 632, the year the prophet died, the Byzantine uh, emperor, the Roman emperor, issued an edict that was going to force all the Jews in the Roman Empire to convert, to convert to Christianity. Something that had never been done before. Forcible conversion of all the Jews in the Roman Empire. Fortunately, just a few years later, all the Byzantine lands fell under Muslim rule, and these Jews were not forced to convert. In fact, they thrived. And you can go read uh, David uh, Wasser Wasserman's book, for pres a professor at, uh, um, at Vanderbilt University, How Islam Saved the Jews. Very interesting uh, article he wrote. Sorry, not a book. But you can find it online. Similarly, why would Muslims, anyone ever wonder why Muslims built their first city in Egypt where Cairo is now? It wasn't Cairo back then. It was called Fustat. Why did they build it there? I mean, they could have... Alexandria is a much bigger city. Why didn't they go and make their capital Alexandria? Because they were a collection of monasteries. They still are a collection of monasteries where now Cairo is. And Muslims settled there because they were there and they were, the, the, the monks in the monastery were going to help them administer Egypt because the Byzantine emperor had forced the Coptic bishop to leave his position and had appointed a Byzantine Orthodox bishop in his place. And the, Byzant and the Muslims, when the Muslims invaded, they went in with the support of that ousted, Byzantine, uh, the ousted Coptic bishop, and they put him back on in charge of the, the church in Egypt. So they entered with the support of, the, of many of the, the, Coptic, the Coptic clergy there.
What about religious toleration? This, uh, to this day, I, I get surprised by this. I couldn't remember the first time I read this, I was so surprised. So Muslim scholars had a debate. They talked about this issue because it happened. What happens if there's a Zoroastrian in Zoroastrianism, and this, is true, this was true in Zoroastrianism up until the 1300s. You could have brother-sister marriage and father-daughter marriage and mother-son marriage. Actually, it happened. It wasn't just a theory. It actually happened. And so the question was, can a Muslim judge, let's say a brother-sister married couple, Zoroastrians, come to the Muslim judge. Can the Muslim judge adjudicate their marriage? Let's say they have some dispute over maintenance or property. The answer is, the, the majority answer for Muslim scholars is yes, you can. Even though this is something that is completely haram in Islam, the Muslim judge, he accepts, he said, this is your religion, you have your religion, I have my religion. I disapprove of it, I don't accept it, but I'm in a, I acknowledge you have this right. Similarly, if people had, who weren't Muslims had riba contracts, Muslim, if you have a riba contract, it's an invalid contract. No judges, it's like having a, like a, 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 you know, a drug dealer is coming and saying, you know, he cheated me out of my cocaine shipment or something. Judges aren't going to listen to that. The same thing in Islamic law, if you have riba contract. But if it was people who were not Muslim of riba contract, Muslim judges had no problem adjudicating it. Even sati, sati, the, the, the uh, widow self-immolation, the tradition, especially amongst the Rajputs in India, where a Rajput noblewoman, when her husband died in battle, she would throw herself on the, the funeral pyre. And you can go, if you go to some of these old cities in Rajasthan, in India, you can see on the walls of some of the big fortresses, these handprints in henna, where women would put their handprint on the wall as they were going out to, to throw themselves on the pyre. And of course, it's a very controversial. And in fact, the British ended up banning it in 1829. And still to this day, I mean, people will talk about this. And it's still a very controversial practice. Muslims allowed it. On one condition, you had to get the permission of the sultan. This, we know this in the case of the Delhi Sultanate. The Delhi sultans allowed this. But you had to get permission of the sultan. Why? Because the sultan, Muslims have a rule. We will allow non-Muslims to practice their religion amongst themselves, even doing things that we think are haram, like drinking alcohol and raising pigs and marrying brothers and sisters and having ribbon contracts. But nobody, as long as no haq adami, as long as no, no one's rights are being violated. So let's say there's a religion where it's okay to go up and just knock someone on the head with a tack hammer and take their money. No, that's not okay because this is violation of acknowledged rights that people have. You have a right to property. That's a human right in Islam. You have a human right to property. But if the woman herself wanted to do this, if she wanted to throw herself on the pyre, the Muslim, the Muslim sultan, at least the evidence we have, there's not a lot of it, but at least the evidence we have says that they didn't have, Muslim rulers had no problem if they did this. There's a level of toleration. Imagine, imagine in America today, American court acknowledging brother-sister marriage. American courts don't even acknowledge polygamous marriages. So this is a level of, of uh, Muslims are very serious when they talk about religious liberty. They're very serious. So what are the lessons that we can take away from this today? And the more I, I was, as I was listening to the speeches and I was uh, talking to um, a lovely sister from South Africa, always wonderful to meet South African Muslims, we were speaking earlier about rights, rights. So wherever Islam spreads, rights spread, justice spread. Wherever their Islam spread, liberty spread, religious liberty. In America today, Muslims can be pillars of rights and religious liberty. Pillars of rights and religious liberty. And I was, someone came to my office the other day and asked me a very interesting question. They said, what would you what would you like to see, if you could affect change in the society, what would you like to see? What would you be your, how would you measure your, the success of Muslims in this country? And I'm sure there's lots of great religious ways that I could measure that, and you know, Sheikh Hamza could probably give much better discussion of that. But the thing that came to my mind, I had this image of a statue on the National Mall, and a statue of a hijabi woman. Probably we shouldn't have statues. Okay, that's one problem with my vision. But um, I don't know. Find out some way to do this. Maybe it's a stylized statue or it's a calligraphy statue, right? But my idea was the statue of a Muslim woman wearing a hijab, who is going to be this, who is going to be an acknowledged 
hero of civil liberties in America. So that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, people, people in the United States were gonna look and say it was Muslims who stood up for civil liberties, who stood up for rights and liberty in this country. They became a column that held this up. Like where Islam spread, liberty spread, justice spread, so too here in the United States where there's promise of liberty and justice. But people try and take that liberty and, liberty and justice away from people without due process, because of bigotry, because of fear. Muslims can stand up against that and be a column, a buttress against that. So what can we do today? What, what, how can we, when people talk about rights, it, you have the idea of exercising your right. I wanna exercise my right to freedom of speech. I actually think that word exercise is very important. Rights aren't things that you just have. You know, it's not like jumper cables in your car or you, know, you leave them under your seat for two years and then you use them, you have to exercise rights. It's like a muscle, you have to exercise it. This is very important. We always have to exercise our rights because otherwise you don't know how to use them. You don't know how to be courageous. You have to pr practice being courageous. And it's hard because a lot of times Muslims, especially Muslims in certain parts of the country who tend to be doing very well for themselves, mashallah, as a descendant of immigrants who came here centuries ago and never made any money, I have nothing but respect for my brothers and sisters here. People who have good life in this country, they think sometimes they can just hide. They can keep low and they'll, they'll be safe. Well, this is a bad year for that plan. Because let me tell you, if you're an oppressed minority, you can't hide. It doesn't, you don't even have to be Muslim. They go after Sikhs. They go after this, this Buddhist monk got beaten up, for God's sake, right? You can't hide. But nor should you have to. You shouldn't have to in this country. And if you don't practice being strong, you won't be able to be strong when the time comes, when challenges really present themselves. How do we practice? How do we exercise courage? Let's think about how do we do it with rights. People have a right to a fair trial. People have a right to be considered innocent until they're proven guilty. We need to practice that. We need to exercise that. I don't care. Just try this. This is what I do. I mean, I don't want to use myself as an example, especially because my wife would probably disagree with me being used as a model, but I'll just tell you what I do. Whenever somebody, you see someone come up on TV and they say, well, this person's guilty. This person's guilty. Even like Bill Cosby. Everybody loves to, to say how bad Bill Cosby is. You know what I always say when people mention Bill Cosby? I say, Innocent until proven guilty. Innocent until proven guilty. It's a very simple, it's, not, it's our legal obligation. People in this country are innocent until they are proven guilty. And it doesn't matter how nasty they are. It doesn't matter how mean they are. It doesn't matter what they're accused of. It doesn't matter the length of the sheet that the government brings out and reads all the crimes they're accused of and that everyone's so sure they did. They are innocent until they're proven guilty. Just like the Prophet, salam, accepted the oath of that man in his own self-defense, even though he was a sinner. People are innocent until they're proven guilty. You need to practice that. You need to exercise that belief. There's no, no guilt by association. This is very important. I remember just a few months ago when the San Bernardino attack happened and there's people from uh, CARE came out and were supporting the families of the, one of the shooters. I think it was the, 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 the guy's family, right? And one of my friends is probably a Donald Trump supporter. He said, he called me, he's like, why are these people on TV? Why is the, he's not Muslim. He's like, why are the funds of the Muslim community being used to support these people, these people? I said, these are the families. They didn't do anything. Even if, let's say they committed a crime. Let's say the parents committed some crime or something like that. They're innocent until proven guilty. They deserve to have legal representation. They deserve to have support. Is this the kind of community we're going to be? We turn our backs on people the second they're under suspicion? No. This is precisely when you show your strength. It's precisely when people are, are being accused that you need to stand by them. Precisely when pe the, the, the media or the public is trying to make them toxic that you have to hold them close. That's a matter of principle. And by the way, you're going to be happy that people have exercised that right when you get accused. And when, like Eric Clapton says, nobody knows you when you're down and out. Sorry, that song always comes to my mind. Too much uh, Eric Clapton unplugged when I was in high school. The, but I want you to stand by people's family. And here's a great way to exercise this right. On my website, 
drjonathanbrown.com, I think. It was a present. Oh, they, there's a link that says write to, write to a prisoner. There's all these Muslim prisoners who've been t- targeted by things like we saw in Orange County, who've been victim of uh, uh, basically entrapment, or maybe they even committed crimes. Maybe they even committed crimes. It doesn't matter. You are allowed to write them. You are allowed to write them a letter. Even if they're a horrible criminal, you can write them a letter and say, Assalamu alaikum. I just want you to know that there are people out here who are thinking about you. And you, when you talk to prisoners, they tell you when they get these letters, it makes the, the world a difference to them. It means everything to them. Just getting a letter means so much. And you can, uh, also during Ramadan, uh, there's on my website as well a link for a group, NC. PCF, National Coalition for the Preservation of Civil Liberties, Civil Freedoms, where you can help donate money to prisoners, Muslim prisoners during Ramadan so they have money to buy food during Ramadan. This is very, it's, I want you to practice this. It's legal, there's nothing wrong with it. It is legal, there's nothing wrong with it. It's your right, you need to exercise these rights. Don't let fear make you deprive yourself of rights. Don't make fear deprive other people of rights to contact, to support, to, 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 to association. Because that's how, that's how majorities work in societies. That's how they keep minorities under control, keep them in their place. They don't do it necessarily through physical oppression. They don't do it necessarily by putting people in prison. They do it by creating fear. You have to break that barrier of fear. You have to break it by exercising your rights. Finally, what about liberties? How can Muslims contribute to the preservation of liberty in this country? Well, we're going to have a chance. <laughs> we have a chance now. That's a great thing about being Muslim in this country. It's always interesting, right? Always have a chance to make a difference. We need to, we need to ask people how far, how, much, how, how serious are they about religious liberty? You know, you often, I just read the art, this other article, the, this article the other day, I was very upset by it. This, Mus, this Muslim named Ed Hussein, who works for, used to work for the Quilliam Foundation in England. Some of you people from the UK know about this. Uh, and I think now he works for the Tony Blair Faith Foundation. He wrote this article where he said, he said, talking about how Muslims don't stand up against extremism. One of the things he said that Muslims need to stop doing, he said, Muslims, they, they put, the, they wear hijab, they put hijab on their young girls, as younger as five, four or five years old. First of all, and I don't have any daughters, but I'm pretty sure girls, when they put on hijab, they want to look like their mom. They want to look like their mom. And you know what? It's their right to look like their mom. And you know what? Guess what? If a Jewish parent wants to put a yarmulke on their child or a certain type of clothing on their child, you better believe that's their right in this country. And you better believe no one's going to tell them they can't do it. This is our right as parents to raise our children according to our religion. Why is it a sign of extremism? Why is it something to be disgusted at or to be poo-pooed or to be looked down on that Americans are exercising their right to freedom of religion by having their children grow up in the same religious tradition as they did? These are things that people, you know, how many times have you heard, how many times as a Muslim have someone come to you and said, as if you're a woman, why don't you just take your hijab off tonight? Just take it off, you know, or when they offer you pork, why don't you just try some pork? Come on. Or why don't you just try some alcohol? Don't be such a, don't be so, don't be so serious. Since when has it become un-American not to drink? Since when is it un-American to cover your hair? Since when is it un-American to have a beard? Being American has nothing to do with how you dress. Go ask Amish people. Go ask Jewish people in this country. Being American doesn't mean you drink alcohol. Go ask Mormons. They don't even drink caffeine. No one has a right to make you dress in a certain way or drink something or eat something to prove you're you're American. You don't have to do that. They don't have the right to ask you to do that. So again, how are we going to exercise? How are we going to exercise this liberty? We need to make people in our daily lives, we need to make them respect our right as Muslims, our right as Americans to have freedom of religious practice. And it's tough. It's been really tough, especially when you're young. And I have so much respect for young Muslims when I meet them because they're so strong. 
and they are so guided, they're so focused on what's right. So I'm very optimistic about the future. It's going to be a tough time ahead. But, inshallah, this will be a chance for American Muslims to, as Muslims have done in the past, bring justice, bring liberty, and in, do so, in doing so, win the respect of others in this country who claim, many of whom claim sincerely, to value this justice and liberty very much. Jazakallah khair.